With your host, Andrew Donaldson, this is Heard Tell. Hi, welcome back to Heard Tell. I'm Andrew Donaldson. It is Tuesday. It is July the 19th, year of our Lord. 2022 continues to roll along as we're trying to finish off July here before it finishes us off. If you're in one of these heat wave areas or in the political and cultural realm, hope you and yours are well wherever you are across the street or around the world. Thank you so much for giving us the most important thing you have, your time. Got a lot to cover today that we want to get to. Uh, we're going to check in with our UK friends. They continue to whittle down uh, the leadership in the Conservative Party on who their next prime minister is is going to be and it's getting a little ugly and a little testy as such things do we'll go over there and check on that meanwhile to the south down in cuba all kinds of trouble uh there is rolling blackouts there is a collapsing healthcare system there's protests in the street and there's a lot of video because of the modern era of the police and the black berets beating people trying to crush dissent it's getting ugly down in cuba we'll touch in on that story. Also, we'll end the program on our good note, like we always do. Uh, one of the major chicken producers in the world brings a ton, literally tons of chicken to a charity cause trying to help out local food banks. Great story there that we'll touch in. Our guest today from Young Voices, Jeff Luce. Uh, we're going to talk a little gas prices. Now, gas prices has eased off a little bit over the last few days in a lot of places across the country, but they're still a lot higher than they used to be. So we'll get into that. What is to blame? Who's to blame? Why are they high? We've talked about it before. We're going to cover it a little bit more. Uh, the president's been talking about it and tweeting about it a lot, or his comm staff has anyway. How much is his fault? How much is not his fault? We're going to talk gas prices with our friend Jeff Luce from Young Voices as our guest today. But first, um, let's go to this because it's silly season, folks. Let, let, we talk about turning down the noise of the news cycle. Well, the, no the news cycle is called a cycle for a reason. It has a circadian rhythm to it. Even in election year, there's up stages and there's down stages. Right now, there's not a big marquee primary race in the political calendar until Arizona on August the 2nd. Now, that doesn't mean these other races aren't important. It just means they don't fill in those gaps in the national media narrative like some of the other ones have, that one's going to be big and messy and loud. We've talked to our friend uh, Joe Zemensky about that. We'll probably have him back on after that primary goes off. But what happens is during silly season, we start getting silly stuff. Uh, note this one. We're going to go to Business Insider and pick on them a little bit. Headline, if not Trump versus Biden in 2024, then who? Here are the politicians showing signs they could be in the mix. Let's just pause right here. Uh, if there's breath in his body, Joe Biden's going to run again. Uh, Donald Trump is giving every indication that he's going to run again. So a lot of so their premise right up front, they're telling you that this is kind of a silly season story. And then they go to list off the usual suspect, Ron DeSantis, uh, Gavin Newsom, uh, Vice President Harris on down the list, uh, Secretary Buttigieg. Um, and they go down the list. The reason I call this silly season is because this is filler. The media does this, especially our broadcast news media, because we've told you before, the talking head shows especially, they have a format. You have your story, and then the second segment, you bring an expert on to talk about the lead story. And then your third segment is having a panel discussion about whatever the expert said about the lead story, and there's your first 30 minutes of your program. Silly season, fodder, filler. Anytime you need ratings, you can pull up Donald Trump or Joe Biden because he's the current president, and that fills it in. So the idea of replacing them, that really gets people filled in. But a lot of this is just filler nonsense. There is two uh, names on these lists, though, that I want to bring attention to because they're getting attention in media. And you do never get attention in media by accident, especially when it comes to people who are laying groundwork for presidential runs. They, lead, they get that groundwork on purpose because it's part of their strategy. Um, J.B. Pritzker who is the governor of Illinois, keeps popping up in these stories. Why? Well, because he wants it to. This is a very, very rich man. He's the governor of Illinois, of course. He's making it very apparent that he plans to run. He has a lot of money to run, and he wants to get involved. 
the other one on the Democratic side that keeps getting louder and louder is Gavin Newsom. Now, he's always been super ambitious ever since he came up through the political ranks out in San Francisco, but his name keeps getting name dropped out there. Uh, why are those two getting some attention? I suspect uh, part of it on the Democratic side is you have a big problem if you don't run Joe Biden. Most of the people that get named to replace Joe Biden couldn't beat Joe Biden. Uh, all due respect to Vice President Harris, she didn't even make it into the calendar year 2020 on her presidential bid. Pete Buttigieg, who's the other person who gets a lot of press as maybe being next one up or having a bright future. Uh, new resident of J Michigan, by the way, we covered that story where he's going to go and work on things he needs to work on, like his demographics and his broad approach to getting different uh, people groups into his camp. Good place to do it. Smart politics on his part. But they're pro the reason they are cabinet officials right now is because they couldn't beat Joe Biden. Joe Biden put together a constituency to beat Donald Trump and become president. You're not going to get the same constituency if you don't have Joe Biden. So that's why a lot of this is people looking outside for whoever might be next if, and I think it's nonsense, Joe Biden doesn't run. I think Joe Biden runs again as long as he has breath in his body, but you never know. Weird stuff happens. We will see. Two names on the Republican side, though, that are getting a lot of attention. Ron DeSantis, obviously, we've talked about it before, governor of Florida. Uh, interesting enough, Governor Newsom is taking direct shots and running ads in Florida against him. That's a fundraising ploy more than anything else. It's showing you're going to fight the new big bad, which a lot of people think will be Ron DeSantis. The other name that's interesting here is Glenn Youngkin. Now, a lot of people are like, well, why is Glenn Youngkin? He just got elected governor of Virginia. Well, remember, in Virginia, your term limited to one six-year term. That's all you get. Now, you can run again later, but he only gets six years. He'd be four years into the job. So people are talking about potentially Glenn Youngkin. Uh, a couple other names on here real quick. Ted Cruz is on here. He was the runner-up, believe it or not, of the 2016 campaign against Trump. He has no national future. Remember that Trump ripped his political soul out of him, wore it as a hat, and then paraded around and made sure Ted Cruz had to compliment how much he loves Donald Trump's new hat of Ted Cruz's political soul. That man's going nowhere. You can ignore him safely. Uh, and then you get into the really crazy stuff. Mike Pence is going to run for president. Uh, just real quick, we're going to deal with this in the future, but Mike Pence if you look at how he's positioned himself, you look at the way he's put a campaign together, this is one coldly calculating dude. He has decided that he could hitch his wagon to Donald Trump. Now he is separating from Donald Trump. He is purposeful, he is calculating, and he is laying groundwork. I don't think he has a path in the Republican Party, but we will see. But Mike Pence is out there also laying groundwork. But again, this is all just fun speculation because this is the silly season part of the midterm elections, and this is all for 2024. But we need to be cognizant that 2024 is well underway. More hurt tell right after this. Welcome back to Hertel. Let's go down south of our own borders to Cuba. Of course, our neighbor just 90 miles off the coast of Florida, long troubled, long under communist dictatorship. Of course, we have an embargo on them that is lifted somewhat over recent years, but it's still mostly in place. So it's a complicated situation. Let's go to the Miami Herald. Um, for the last few weeks, it hadn't gotten a lot of coverage in America because we've been busy with other things. There's been a lot of protests on the island. A lot of problems on the island. The healthcare system is collapsing. There is widespread blackouts, energy problems, fuel problems. A lot of stuff we've been covering in other parts of the world is hitting Cuba as well. Let's go to the Miami Herald. Recent videos and publications on social media uh, show how volatile the situation in Cuba remains. A year after historic anti government protests shook the island, underscoring the country's deteriorating economic and human rights situation with hashtags. Uh, Cuba on the streets and SOS Cuba, social media users have been sharing images of anti-government protests and police beatings 
as well as stories of Cubans suffering and dying because of health care failures. Again, this is Nora Gomez Torres writing in the Miami Herald. Tired of the frequent blackouts. Residents of Los Palacios, I apologize, by the way, uh, I don't hobble real well, so I'm probably going to mispronounce a lot of things in here. Just bear with me. A town in the westernmost province of Pino del Rio took to the streets late Thursday night to protest against the government. It's difficult to assess the magnitude of the demonstrations because the videos were shot in the darkness during an electricity outrage. Still, the crowd can be heard insulting Cuban leader Miguel Diaz Canel, who, which is a crime under the Cuban law. The demonstration happened just days after the one-year anniversary of the July 11, 2021 protest. Hundreds of Cubans who joined those protests were given long prison sentences, and many were accused of political crimes like sedition. Cuban state media later acknowledged a quote-unquote incident in Los Palacios. Netblocks and other internet tracking platforms confirmed there were internet outages in the early morning on Friday, and the government shut down the service to stop the images from circulating. The same night in Havana, a mother of two, including one child with disabilities, protested the conditions of her home in a park near the Capitol where the National Assembly meets. She attracted a small crowd. According to images shared on social media, the video of special forces agents known as the Black Berets and police officers beating people attending the Congre de la Hoya's parade in Santiago del Cuba circulated on social media on Saturday in a separate event in Habana del Este, I think, I hope, forgive me, a neighborhood east of Havana, police officers violently arrested 23-year-old Alejandro Tomeo Chacon, according to video recorded by his relatives. And this actually has video of this from a Twitter feed. Miami TV station Telemundo 51 reported Saturday he was one of three Cuban migrants who were interdicted by the U.S. Coast Guard on July 9th while attempting to reach U.S. shore and on a pedal boat. He was repatriated on July the 13th. His pregnant wife told Telemundo 51 he was accused of resisting authorities and stealing the pedal boat, and the police officers broke into their house without a warrant, showing the poor conditions of their home. His mother told Telemundo 51 that her son wanted to immigrate so they could, quote, live well at least once in their lives. After years of budget cutbacks in the health system to prioritize construction of hotels for tourists, the COVID-19 pandemic exposed the deteriorating state of the Cuban healthcare system. A new hero hijack new fever epidemic is again straining the system, exposing the lack of medicines, basic supplies, and ambulance services. Um, at 4 p.m. Thursday, Mar- Mar- Martez Barrios, I hope I'm pronouncing that, posted a desperate call on Facebook. I need an ambulance. My son is dying, she wrote in all caps. She said her son, 26-year-old Andy Aguero Barrios, who is autistic and blind, was in urgent need of a transfusion. They had been at a local clinic in the neighborhood of Havana's periphery since Thursday morning and needed an ambulance to get into a hospital. The nearest hospital was only nine miles away, but when one ambulance vehicle showed up, she said the crew wouldn't take him. She said she had no other means to take him to the hospital, and her son died at 6 p.m., she said in another post. Cuban Ministry of Health officials said the young man was eventually taken to the hospital and died of cardiorespiratory arrest, but a statement includes information attempting to shift blame on the family. For example, the ministry said the family had refused to get him admitted earlier and that they had also refused an autopsy. The statement does not mention the long wait for the ambulance, but as the authorities were aware of complaints about the quality of care provided by the ambulance crew, the ministry said the crew would be disciplined without providing further details. Davis Lawton, a medic who said he was on the ambulance, said on Facebook that there was only one ambulance to respond to emergencies in four Havana municipalities. On Friday, another desperate mother posted pictures on Facebook of her daughter in Havana hospital bed where she was admitted with hemorrhagic Danu fever. The mother said the daughter had anemia because of the bleeding provoked by the disease. Quote, better kill me already because I can't stand seeing my children like this. Addressing Cuban leader Diaz Canel, she urged him to stop blaming the U.S. embargo for all the country's ills, either leave the country or send us to another country, she wrote. Canel, the killer of children. More heard tell right after this.
Uh, we're back to Hurt Tell. Okay, let's talk gas prices a little bit. What's really going on? The White House is saying one thing. The gas companies are saying one thing. Social media is saying one thing. Let's turn down the noise on it. Let's turn to another of our great Young Voices contributors, uh, Jeff Luce. How are you, sir? Thank you for coming and spending a little time with us. Yeah, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, anytime, buddy. Okay, uh, the Biden administration, you were writing a national review about this, but let, let's start big picture with what the Biden administration's done last game. I openly tweeted about it. I think they need to just fire their whole comm shop because there's been really bad on this. Um, the president, uh, I guess about two weeks ago now, wrote an open letter. I don't know how else to say it to the oil executives. Um, they are now uh, continuing the narrative about gas prices and, quote unquote, asking gas stations to lower their prices, which is not good. We had uh, the White House press secretary at the podium this past week getting kind of tangled up on the same messaging. Turn the noise down for us, though. We know that gas is a lagging indicator, uh, meaning what you're seeing at the pump is something that happened six months ago, 18 months ago, two years ago. Turn down the noise for us. Where is this gas price increase really coming from? Yeah, that's that's a good point. And that's a good question. Um, so it, it's really we're still recovering from the impacts of COVID-19. Um, so you know, around March or April 2020, gas, a barrel of gas um, or a barrel of oil, I should say, was literally trading for a negative value. Um, so that sent a market signal to a lot of producers that they didn't need to produce because it wasn't in their best interest to do so, um, which, of course, rippled and sent another signal to refiners um, that they wouldn't need to refine any oil. And also with that, what happened was a lot of refineries also closed. So we're still feeling uh, delays with supply and demand because once economies started opening up um, after restrictions lifted, you know, you started to see demand for oil and gas spike, but unfortunately supply wasn't able to keep up. So we're still seeing those impacts. Now, to be fair to President Biden, we've, we've said that this is one of our principles on this program. Uh, when it comes to the economy, the president gets too much blame and too much credit. When it comes to gas prices, that goes double. Uh, they get too much blame and too much credit. Break down the ratio, though. We understand the war in Ukraine raised gas prices. We also understand gas prices were already high before that happened. We also, we've got it on video, which I don't know why people pretend this don't happen. President Biden ran on an anti-fossil fuel pledges. That means the markets react when he wins the presidency as opposed to somewhere else because they're planning two or three years ahead. Break the ratio down for me. How much of it is the Biden administration's fault? How much is not? How much of it is it's not helping, but it's not really hurting either. Just kind of lay out that ratio for us a little bit. Yeah, and I, I think that's a great point. Um, you'll you'll drive through America and it's easy to see those signs of like, you know, it's a sticker of Biden pointing at the gas price and he's say, saying it, you know, I did that, um, which is ultimately unfair. It's hard to maybe put down an exact ratio. Maybe it's two to one or three to one. Um, it's mostly to do with the global impact and global markets. Um, but he certainly has some culpability with it. Uh, like you said, he ran on an anti-fossil fuel agenda. There's even a video of him uh, speaking to people in Delaware. And he, he promised that he'd um, mo move us on from American fossil fuels. So that obviously sends a signal to producers um, that, their, that their product isn't wanted, A. Um, and then B, there are also policy implications. Um, so on his first day in office, he you know, axed the Keystone XL. He placed a moratorium on uh, new oil and gas leasing on federal lands. Um, so all that sends a signal to producers and to investors that, you know, maybe maybe the time for fossil fuels is ending. Um, so he certainly has some blame. Again, most of it's on the global nature of things. And also with Russia, who is supplying about 10% of the, of the world's oil uh, before we rightfully kind of embargoed that. Yeah, Jeff Lewis uh, joining us from Young Voices. Let, let's take it from this angle because you touched on it in your piece, Natural, National Review, which we have linked to in the show notes. Everybody should read it in its entirety. The production part of this is what nobody want, really talks about. We all see the end game when it shows up at the pump and the gas prices. And every now and then, of course, they'll talk about crude oil prices. It's the middle of that that's really affecting all this. And part of it, and you touched on it in your piece, is refining capability. We haven't built a lot of refineries. Um, we have trouble upgrading them. That comes from our climate policies. That comes from our environmental concerns. Those are valid concerns, but this is also the trade-off. When you don't build new refineries, when you don't update your refineries, when you don't update that infrastructure, regardless of what's going on globally, you're going to have a supply problem and a production problem. 
And then when you have a global crisis, it goes from bad to catastrophic. Isn't that the piece of this that people are really missing? 100%. Um, and crude prices make up the majority of gas prices, but refinery capacity is also really important. So in 2021, our refinery uh, capability globally, it declined for the first time in 30 years. Um, as of April, it's still well below pre-pandemic levels. Um, and another thing that has to do with that is the different types of crude. So you have heavy and light crude. Both are used for gas production, um, but both require, require different refinery uh, capabilities. So a majority of the uh, crude that's produced in the U.S. is actually light, um, which means there's less refining that's needed. But with that, it's sold at a higher rate to refineries. Um, so a majority of the refineries in the U.S. actually refine the heavier crude that's imported, usually from Canada. Um, so like you said, if we're not investing in new refineries and the refineries that we have don't always um, aren't always tailored to the crude that's produced here, it's going to send a ripple effect and it's going to, you know, lag with demand. Yeah. And it's not just us. You touched on it in the piece, uh, 2021, which would be the last year we have statistics, obviously, because we're still in the current year. Uh, so those will be numbers for 2020. Global refinery capacity shrunk by 730,000 barrels. That's a, that's a number that doesn't mean anything to a lot of people, but this number should. That's the first decline in 30 years. It's not just America. Globally, refinery capability has gone down. That puts pressure on the final product. And the gas price thing is not just an American problem, to be fair to the president again here for a minute. We've had our Australian friends on. They're having a massive gas problem. Uh, obviously, Europe is having a natural gas problem because they get that from it. This is really a global issue when it comes to refining capability. And what we're seeing is this is just the bumping up of the modern order of where people want that cheap energy, but they want climate stuff. But then when the cheap energy doesn't go, they go, well, wait a minute, why is this happening? Why do we have that cognizant disconnect between those two things of like, look, this is the effect of 20, 30 years of policy. You asked for this, not to put too fine a point <laughs> on it. This is what you wanted to do. Now we're here. Now people are like, well, wait a minute. We didn't really mean it. Is, is that a fair way of putting some of this policy stuff? I would say so. Um, I mean, you have Europe, like you said, they have the natural gas shortages. Um, and especially with Germany, you saw them transition completely away from all fossil fuels and subsequently nuclear energy uh, around 2011 after Fukushima. Um, so then they you know, transition more towards renewables, but that means they have to import baseload power from Russia. Uh, so it is, it is kind of a catch-22. You know, you want, you want emissions reductions, which is a very noble goal, but you also need to think of consumers, you need to think of energy reliability. So I think this whole global problem is really showing that you know, in order for any really durable climate solutions to take place, you have to take into account uh, affordability and reliability. So uh, I think that's where American fossil fuels can actually play a really big role. They can, um, they can play a significant role in reducing global emissions uh, by displacing dirtier uh, fuel sources. So American natural gas, liquefied natural gas, uh, it's far cleaner burning than Russian natural gas. It's cleaner than Chinese coal. Uh, the same goes for our petroleum and our, our oil. It's cleaner than Venezuelan or uh, OPEX. So it's, it's really, you're going to need a holistic approach um, with the climate and the energy policies. And I think, you know, the Biden administration would do well to recognize that American fossil fuels have a really, really important role to play with that. Yeah, my background is actually in transportation. And we've been using propane forklifts for 20, 30 years in warehousing and, and dock situations for that very reason, because you can't breathe in there running gasoline. I've had to do it. Uh, standing behind diesel fumes is not fun. Uh, but that's a great example. And Amazon bought something like a thousand natural gas, heavy trucks, tractor trailer type trucks. Uh, so it's not, you know, my opinion, we need to be all of the above on things, not just electric, but natural gas and other things. They're looking into hydrogen. We'll talk about that more. Jeff Lou's still joining us. Um, real quick on this before we pivot a little bit, though. Um, talk about the signal sending. When they change oil prices like an OPEC, that's signal sending. When we change refinery capability or decrease, that's signal sending. When we change environmental policy, that's signal sending. When we change presidents in America, because if we go from a Republican president to a Democratic president, that's a signal sending to the markets. Talk about how, although these things are very volatile, there is some predictable rhythms to these based on the signals. Summer driving season, prices are going to go up. 
winter time coming in Europe in the Western Hemisphere, uh, prices for fuel oil will go up. Talk about those signals and the rhythms of it that you can kind of predict some of this stuff. And there is kind of a circadian rhythm to it all, isn't there? Yeah. Uh, and that's like you said, especially with summer. Um, so that's when most drivers hit the road for well-deserved vacations that they've been saving up for. Um, and same with the winter, uh, obviously you're going to need more natural gas to heat homes, which unfortunately there's some dire predictions for Europe, uh, this winter, especially with them being cut off from Russian supplies and them trying to rush, uh, American LNG to the market. Um, but yeah, like you said, like policymakers and economists, they can kind of predict that there's going to be higher demand, especially right around now. Um, so there's, you know, a few things that they can do to bring more supply to the market, especially on the policymaker side. Uh, one thing would be, you know, suspending uh, summer blending requirements. So the way gas is blended, it's different winter to summer um, due to the heat. So summer oil or summer gas is uh, less susceptible to evaporation, but that takes more to refine. It takes a longer process. So just suspending simple things like that could, you know, it's not going to reduce prices incredibly, but it's still going to do a little bit to, to reduce the pain at that pump. Yeah, Jeff Luce joining us. We're going to talk about some of those uh, ways to reduce and or increase the pain in the pump, depending on your policy. We're also going to work through some of the cliches he touched on in his piece. Uh, things like changing the blends, uh, just drill, things like this. We're going to get into that right after the break. Jeff Luce from Young Voices uh, from the D.C. area joining us on Herd Tell. More with him right after the break. Tell Jeff Luce joining us. Uh, climate, energy, he talks about these things. He's a Young Voices contributor, sharp guy. Make sure you're following him. His social media is right there on the lower third graphic if you're watching on YouTube or the Facebook live feed for our Big Talker radio partner. Uh, let's work through some cliches here because we like to turn down the noise here. There's a lot of buzzwords when it comes to fuel and energies. So let's work through some of the buzzwords and cliches and slogans and see if we can get to some truth. You touched on one of them in your piece. Um, well, we'll just change the blend and that'll change the price on the pump. Turn the noise down on that one because people reacted pretty strongly when they started dinkering around with the fuel and ethanol blends and things like that. What's fact and what's fiction there? Yeah, so especially with the ethanol blends, obviously that's a pretty big boon economically in the Midwest, um, but it's mostly subsidized. Uh, and there's been studies that have found that um, the ethanol blending really doesn't provide marginal environmental benefits, um, especially for the economic, uh, the economics of it. So as with any, you know, energy or climate policy, really any, any policy, you have to, you know, assess a proper uh, benefit, cost benefit ratio. Um, so really reducing or even eliminating the ethanol mandate. Um, it's not going to do much to increase emissions, especially outside of the Midwest. Um, and it, it, it is going to help a little bit with the prices. Um, and same with the summer blending requirements, although it's not ideal to suspend those uh, whenever you have situations like this where people are paying, you know, in May, they paid 100 extra dollars a month on gas than they did the previous May. So this is really impacting consumers. So, um, you know, simple reforms like that, although maybe it's not ideal, uh, they can definitely do a lot to reduce prices. All right. Another one you touched on in your piece uh, roundaboutly, uh, but I want to bring it up. Uh, I was critical of the decision too, but people are resurrecting it in lieu of the gas prices. Uh, the day one Keystone Pipeline uh, decision by President Biden, not exactly a straight line between those two things, but people are using it that way. Uh, break that one down. What actually did it affect? What did it not affect when it comes to things like energy and fuel prices? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a good point. It's, it's again, one of those things, it's easy to just point the finger at President Biden. Um, I mean, ide ideally, he would have approved it. That would have sent a signal, especially to producers, um, that you know, American fossil fuels, or it's not even American. I mean, it would have been imported from Canada. But fossil fuels in general have a, a role to play in our economy and in our energy mix. 
uh, him suspending it, I mean, it was more of a rhetorical political signal. Um, they would likely still be building it. Um, they would still have to, you know, finish the construction and the processing. Um, what it does do though, um, we're still gonna be importing oil from Canada. It didn't stop that. It did add fuel and transportation expenses because pipelines are the most efficient way that we can transport fuel to and forward. Um, but now it's gonna be transported on truckers and trains, which obviously it takes longer to get to market, to get to refineries. Um, so him revoking the permit for that, although maybe it's not a straight line shot, it at the very least it sent signals that, you know, we're not gonna be too favorable towards fossil fuels, especially in the near future. And it also just delays supply coming to the market. Yeah. Can you talk to Jeff Luce? All right. We kind of touched on this one when we talked about refining capability, but let's deal with the buzzword. Uh, a lot of folks on the right say, well, we just need to drill more. Uh, talk about that. We're not against that. Of course, you always, you know, more production, a long term. That's a long term solution that even if you did that today, that really wouldn't affect fuel prices. Break down the, the myth and the magic of just drill baby, as we used to say back in a previous administration, uh, how that does and does not affect prices at the pump. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's again, it's a very easy buzzword to, you know, say drill baby drill or to invoke energy independence. But the reality is oil energy in general, it's very global in nature. So you increase production in America. That's great. I mean, that's awesome, obviously, economically. And, you know, like I touched on, it's also beneficial environmentally. It's produced with far fewer emissions. But uh, we would still have to rely on our partners such as Canada to import fuel. Um, we'd still be slightly beholden to OPEC, who obviously has a large share of the supply. Um, and also, as I said, it's a lot of the crude that's produced in America, although it varies, but most of it is light crude. Um, whereas a lot of the refineries that we have, are they are tailored to uh, refine heavier crude, especially from Canada, um, just because it's cheaper to buy um, so it's more in their economic best interest to do so. Right. Now, that was a buzzword that the right has loved for uh, a oh, better part of a decade now. Uh, let's talk about our progressive friends. They'll sometimes get on social media and they have the great little slogan of, well, we'll just get rid of fossil fuels. That'll solve the problem. Um, I, I know that's very, very unicornish on its face, but policy wise, uh, they try to enact policy that way that has ripple effects just break that one down. Uh, well, if we just go, you know, emissions neutral or get off fossil fuels, that's going to solve the problem. No, that kind of creates a couple of new problems, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Especially since the technology gap between those two things isn't quite as good as we maybe hope it would be. Definitely. Yeah. And I mean, you're, you're seeing that in Germany, although it's not with gasoline, it's with natural gas. Um, they said they were going to completely wean themselves, themselves off of uh, domestically produced natural gas. They shut down their nuclear plants. Um, then they were, you know, beholden to Putin and that kind of funded his war machine. Uh, and now they're even firing up coal plants. So it's, it's all kind of backwards. So the, the push to eliminate fossil fuels, it's very unrealistic, especially when you consider, um, A, the global nature of climate change. I mean, America produces like 12% of emissions a year um, globally. So you know, if you shut down all fossil fuels here, it's going to have a negligible effect on emissions globally, um, while having a pretty big consequence for consumers uh, through higher energy prices. And it's also not going to thwart any future emissions in developing countries, which is, you know, where a lot of future emissions are going to come from, especially from India and China. All right, here's another one I've been seeing a lot more on social media. Well, why don't we just put uh, price controls on the fuel at the pump? Now, a quick le history lesson for folks. Jimmy Carter took the hit for it, but the economy that he mishandled, that ball got kicked off by Richard Nixon starting off with price controls. So you need to go read the history up on how those work. But just on its face of it, uh, the presidential magic wand of just dictating gas prices. Uh, break down the mythology of that one for us. Right. Uh, it's... I mean, it's, it's just one of those things. It's easy to say politically. It's good to get some brownie points with your base. But again, not realistic. Um, price controls aren't going to work, especially if you're imposing them on American production. It's just going to hurt the situation even more. Um, like I said, it's all global supply and demand. So if you're putting a price control here, it's not really going to impact drilling overseas 
<laughs> so, and it's also just the wrong approach. We shouldn't be trying to kneecap producers and kneecap our economy. We should be going the opposite way. We should be trying to embrace more free market economics to you know, unleash innovation. Um, and that's through reducing regulations, uh, not imposing more. Yeah, I'm Jeff Luce joining us. Okay, that was all the political and the rhetorical thing. Give us a couple practical things. We, we've talked broad spectrum about, you know, regulatory side. We understand legislatively probably not a lot going to get done because it's a midterm election year and the House is probably going to split and we'll have split government for the next two years. What practically can be done here? Is it regulatory form? Is it some kind of a bipartisan legislative bill coming up that the Republicans can shove through once they have a majority? What do you think practically in the near term could be something that could get some relief to folks, not a unicorn, not a, we're just going to magically get prices down, but would also be a good long-term policy as well. Yeah, that's a good question. And it's kind of like, uh, kind of like herding cats, you know, you, you don't quite know, <laughs> um, especially with the bipartisan solutions. I mean, you're kind of seeing it increasingly on the left where it's, they're really, uh, doubling down on their anti-fossil approach, which is very unfortunate. Um, and like I said, there's maybe not a ton of things that can be done in the short term. Um, maybe once we see a house flip, we can start seeing some more legislative proposals. Uh, one being with regulations. Um, you know, a really great first step I think would be repealing or at least reforming NEPA and modernizing it. So that's the National Environmental Policy Act. Um, so whenever a large infrastructure project, even if it's not just energy, it could be roads, transmission lines. Um, you know, whenever that's proposed, it has to go through a NEPA process to see if it will have any, you know, undue consequences on the environment, which is very noble. We should be looking to, you know, leave as minimal of an impact as we can. Uh, the problem is it gets tied up in litigation and bureaucracy. So it delays projects by like an average of five years, uh, increases, you know, costs for investors, it, which in turn kind of disincentivizes investment into new projects. Uh, another thing I think would be uh, eliminating steel tariffs. So just like with any industry, uh, refineries are getting hit hard by tariffs, um, which are pretty protectionist policies that haven't really benefited American producers super well. It's really just hurt consumers more than anything. So eliminating tariffs and opening up free trade would, you know, at least lower capital costs for refineries. Um, and then just another thing too, which maybe it won't be bipartisan, maybe it can be Republican led if they get the majority in November. Um, but that's just approving, you know, key infrastructure projects like pipelines, you know, Keystone XL is a good one. Um, you know, just sending that signal to American producers that we want your energy, we need your energy, um, and we can work together to, to help consumers. Yeah, but never say never, because if, if you had asked either one of us in April, if gun legislation was going to pass this year, we would have thought you were crazy. And yet here we are. Public pain has an interesting way of getting stuff through Congress in a big old hurry. And there's a lot of pain on this front. So you never know. So just like to be hopeful. We, we have to be Hopefully. very, we, we have to be yes. really critical <laughs> in what we do. So let's just throw that little lifeline of hope out there. Jeff Lewis joining us. Okay. Kind of put a bow on all this energy stuff. I don't think this crisis is going away. I know folks think the gas prices are probably pretty close to topped out or close to it. They don't think it's going to get a whole lot worse, but it also doesn't look like it's going to get a whole lot better anytime soon. Is that a fair way to kind of address the big picture, at least for the next month or two through the summer? Yeah, I think that's right. Um, you know, starting to see reports that demand's starting to kind of come down a little bit. Um, and that's mostly with fears of a recession. So investors are kind of hedging their bets in that sense. Um, OPEC is set to start drilling a bit more in August, although it's not a ton. Um, and that's kind of where the president's been, I've been kind of asking them to, to drill a bit more. So even if it's not as much as we would want, at least a little bit is going to help. Um, but yeah, in the long term, it seems like high gas prices will probably be here for a while. Um, and again, that's it's a mix of a lot of things. It's global economics. It's the invasion of Ukraine from Russia. It's some policies and some price signals, but it, it looks like, you know, gas prices might be here to stay and uh, consumers might have to get used to it for a little bit at least. Yeah. Jeff Lewis joining us. One last question on this. Um, where does this fit into the greater political spectrum? We know the economy is going to be the number one issue in this midterm election. It's just going to be regardless. I know there's a lot of stuff about, you know, guns and violence and, of course, the abortion thing. It's going to be the economy. How much of the economy discussion do you think it's going to be gas prices in your research as you talk to people, as you do your media? 
Um, mm -hmm. I'm finding it to be really, really high because that's the one, look, I, you know, I've got a Honda Civic. I'm paying double what it cost me last year to put gas in it when I, when I got that vehicle right at double, went from about 25 to about 50. This is something that hits just about every American. And I don't think there's any rhetoric to get around it. Is that the vibe you're getting as well as you research this topic? 100%. Yeah. Uh, polling is showing that that's the number one issue for uh, voters. It's inflation and the economy and gas prices. Um, you know, we, we saw some big wins with, you know, for gun control advocates. Uh, and that might kind of help some Democrats uh, and some incumbents. But yeah, it seems as if voters are definitely feeling the pain at the pump and feeling the pain in their checkbook. Uh, so they're going to they're going to be looking for solutions that kind of curb inflation that can, you know, get us out of this economic downturn. Jeff Luce, uh, great stuff today. Good job breaking down, getting through the noise of this because this topic's really noisy because it's easy to blame people when you're hurting at the pocketbook level. Uh, till we bring you back on the show next time, let folks know where they can follow you, what you have going on, your social media and all that good stuff, my friend. Yeah, so um, you can follow C3 Solutions, who I work for. Um, you can follow us at C3 Solutions News on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn. Um, and we also have an online news magazine called C3. That's at c3newsmag.com. Um, and on there, we publish op-eds, reported pieces on what entrepreneurs in the private sector are doing to, you know, accelerate innovation, but also address these, you know, high, high topic issues like gas prices. Yep. Uh, Jeff Luce, another one of our great young voices contributor, important topic. Uh, I'm sure we'll be talking about it more in the future. Great talking to you, my friend. We'll talk again soon. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you, sir. back to her tell let's update a story we've been following uh the our friends over in the uk are trying to get themselves a new prime minister the conservative party is down to the final three in their elimination contest of candidates once they get down to two it will go to a party-wide vote but they're down to three now uh tom tuggenhat uh, you remember him we covered him back when afghanistan collapsed into chaos at the botched withdrawal there he gave that impassioned speech in the commons that was very moving he's a veteran of the conflict of course uh he's the latest candidate to have to bow out the way they do this is they started with eight they take votes the bottom one is eliminated in each round of voting they also had a televised debate a couple of days ago so now we're down to the final three uh let's go to sky news uh, tom tuggan has become the latest candidate to be knocked out of the conservative leadership race and of course whoever leads the party will automatically become prime minister replacing boris johnson uh, Sky News. In the third round of voting by the Tory MPs, contenders received the following vote. Um, Kimmy Badendock and Penny Morant, Rishi Sunak, Liz Trust, and then uh, Mr. Tug and Hat was at the bottom. Uh, Richie Sunak got the most votes, followed by Penny Mordaunt, uh, Liz Trust third, Kimmy uh, Badendock uh, was also eliminated after the announcement. Ms. Tug and Hat tweeted, although it was not meant to be, I am immensely proud of the positive vision we have put forward for the country. One thing is clear, if we cannot rebuild trust, our party is doomed, not just for now, but for a generation or more. To win an election, we need the country behind us. Our values, our conservative values can only be achieved in government. That's Tom Tuggan had in his, uh, I guess you'd say concession, although he's still an MP. After the vote, Mr. Sunak, who is the most support among the Tory MPs, tweeted, I want to thank all my colleagues who supported me tonight. Together, we can rebuild our economy, keep Brexit safe, and defeat labor. Uh, Penny said, my vote is steady, and I'm grateful for my colleagues for all their support and thrilled to be in second place once more. The MPs know I'm a strong candidate running a truly clean campaign and putting forward a positive vision for the party and our country. Ms. Badendock tweeted, on to the next vote. Thank you all for my colleagues for their support. It's all to play for, continued momentum, closing the gap. I am the only charged candidate left in the race. I'm in it to win it. Two more votes are due to take place on Tuesday and Wednesday until two candidates remain. Then they will face a summer campaigning in Hustings. 
before a vote by the wider party membership with the winner expected to be announced on 5 September. The remaining runners will not face each other in a debate, debate that had been planned for Tuesday after Ms. Sunak and Ms. Truss refused to take part. Conservative MPs are said to be concerned about the damage the previous debates had done to the image of the party after exposing disagreements and splits between the leading candidates. Uh, Labor lead, leader Sir Keir Starmer said he was astonished that those that want to be prime minister of the United Kingdom are pulling out of debates and out of scrutiny. Uh, that's the state of the race over there. Obviously, they're going to vote two more times this week. Should get us down to our final two, and then we can continue to follow this story from our good friends over in the UK. I'm sure we'll have one of our great UK contributors on soon to explain this to us. More Hertel right after this. to her tell let's end on a good note as we always try to do let's go out to missouri sykeston missouri to be exact tyson food uh that would be the chicken folks for those of you from logan uh loaded up its trucks to make a donation that organizers hope will greatly impact families into the boot heel of missouri you know the show me state and that donation will continue to help provide food for people facing hunger in southeast missouri we're very excited to get a very large delivery from Tyson Foods, said Chief Advancement Officer Sarah Garner. That large delivery, including 40,000 pounds of protein, will help meet the needs for many in the area. We regularly survey the people that we serve, and the number one thing we hear back as far as feedback is that they want more protein than produce. And so to get this large donation of protein is giving people exactly what they are wanting, Garner said. In addition to the donation, Sarah Garner with the SEMO Food Bank says, Tyson Food donated $25,000 in grant money. That's going to be used to fund 10 mobiles to Stoddard and Dunklin counties, which are two counties which are in the top 20 in the state of Missouri for food insecurity. And for Tyson Foods, this is a way for them to serve those in the community. It's very heartwarming to get to do something like this and come out and pack each box. And you know they're going to go to local communities that are going through the pantries right here locally, Senior Manager Brian Crow said. Uh, he's with Tyson Foods, and they said they support the Southeast Missouri Food Bank and will continue to do so for many years to come. It's truly remarkable, an opportunity to help and try to impact hunger in our community right here in Southeast Missouri. Tyson Foods has committed to volunteering at the Southeast Missouri Food Bank at least once a month. Uh, good on Tyson, 40,000 pounds of protein and chicken. That'll go a long way, uh, unless it goes to a large family like mine that had the last couple of days but good for them for doing it. That'll do it for Herd Tell. Thank you so much for joining us on this Tuesday. We hope you're well. We hope you're well fed. And wherever you and yours are, we'll talk to you again real soon right here on Herd Tell. All the music on Herd Tell is provided under a creative content license from monstercat.com.